Okay. Hello, everybody. I am Martin from Argentina. Podemos hablar español. Falar, uh, falar. I tried to give, to start talking in Portuguese in one of my old uh, Postgres Brazil conferences, and it was just tragic. So I decided to stick with English, which is something that I do know how to speak. And well, a sizable amount of people here will also understand. Uh, let's see if this works. It does, that's great. Okay, so uh, I was kind of scared listening to Charlie's talk because I was kind of like, oh my God, it's gonna be the same topics and there is a couple of things that are common. Uh, but this is, um, so I've worked for nine years as a software engineer. Uh, then I was kind of a software manager or operations manager at Second Quadrant. Then Second Quadrant was acquired by EDB. Then I passed to be a full manager at EDB for support operation for support a support manager, and during all those years, I've uh, was able to learn how our customers deploy and implement backups and high availability and everything else. So this is um, this is like a case study or uh, just like a experience of several years. Actually, I, we have an experience for a couple of weeks, but I didn't have time to put it in. So uh, what we're going to do in this talk is this, uh, we're going to talk about uh, different failures that customers can run into, what was wrong, and how can you prevent it from happening. Mm -hmm. So these are the th six cases that we're going to look at. One that, yeah, one is, Kind of Charlie talked about RTO and RPO. So we're gonna talk about satisfying the RTO. So the, the RTO is a policy that the company, the business uh, puts in place. You know, it's like they say, well, how much time can we be down? Well, we can be down an hour. We can be uh, down a whole day. I mean, there's, there's businesses that they can say, well, I mean, we can be down the whole day. We'll lose some money, but it's okay. And then you got businesses saying, hey, no, it's five seconds. That's it. You know, the, the whole six nines, well, that, that's where you get. So that's the first. We're gonna talk about um, some issues with, whoops, backups in local storage. Uh, Charlie said a couple of things that kind of align with that. Backups in the same data center. We're gonna talk about the impact of remote backups. So we're gonna be like, growing incrementally, but showing how, okay, we fix one thing, here's another problem that we need to fix. Uh, and then the last two are kind of not so related with the first four, uh, but uh, kind of. Uh, we're gonna talk about, um, uh, why did I put, oh, okay. <laughs> Remote network file system, you know, having your walls in a network file system like N NFS or, or any network file system. And well, it's something commonly used by customers and there's a couple of gotchas there that you, you need to, you just need to be aware of and you need to understand how to. And the six is just, a, I'll leave it as a, the cherry on the top. It's encrypted backups. So let's start with the first slide. Recovery not satisfying RTO. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're basically gonna, you know, you got an RTO, the, the policy that you need to uh, comply with, and you got your backups. Mm -hmm. Disaster happens. Well, you got that, you need to comply with a policy. You can't like say, okay, something happened, we need to wait a day until we recover our 30 terabytes of data. Hmm? So, well, now let's start. There. <laughs> so, let's give some conditions here. Huh? Let's, let's suppose we have a large database, where a large database is uh, something above a terabyte. Let, let's not talk about anything lower than a terabyte. And we're running logical backups. So I guess uh, most of you already understand where the problem is here, right? You know, oh, this is, I think I'm gonna move to the other side. The, this. There, well, did it? Oh. <clears throat> So this is what happens. You know, you run a PG dump to take a logical backup, and well, you know, 
I think this was uh, just above a terabyte. You got like 26 hours of backup, which has a lot of problems that we're not going to talk about, like 26 hours holding a snapshot, bloat on tables, uh, 26 hours of data that you lost, like Charlie said, just uh, so many problems, so many problems here. We had a customer like eight years ago. Uh, that when they joined, we checked their database. They had 12 terabytes, and they had a nightly PG dump running. Sorry. Okay. I just put a comment in front of the PG dump in the cron job and said, this is not working anymore. So let's go back to the, the initial conditions. You know, you got your, your large database, you got your long running logical backups, huh? many hours, a, a whole day, maybe even more. You need the same time or more to recover it, depending on the schemas, you know, if you have many indexes, uh, more or less indexes, it will take more or less time to recover. So <clears throat> you need the backup to finish, then you need to recover it, then you lost 26 hours of data. I think I'll just do this much easier. So what is the solution here uh, to this problem? Well, the solution is don't use PG dump if you have large tables, large databases. Just don't use it. Uh, and what I just mentioned, PG dump is not going to offer you point in time recovery. You're, you don't get point in time recovery with the logical backup. Does anybody know exactly what, what's the point in time of a logical backup recovery? Who said that? I should have said nobody that works with me and nobody from the Postgres community. <laughs> Dave, come on. So the, the backup starts with a snapshot and that's what that's why it's holding back and the, it's it's holding back the X-Min and generating bloat. So it's consistent to the start of the backup. So if it took 26 hours, you lost 26 hours of data. It's consistent. It's a good backup. It's consistent. I mean, you didn't corrupt your data, you just lost it. And in general, just I mean, PG dump, I get into discussions with even with coworkers about if PG dump is a backup tool. It is. It's just not the right tool for this type of backups. No? Like, it's a backup. Yeah, you got a copy. It's not the copy that you want. No, well, it's very used, for example, for uh, archiving partitioning. So you partition, you got partitioning in, in times, uh, sorry. Partition by time, so you got old partitions, newer partitions, then after like three years, you want to archive those. So you detach the partition, you do a PG dump, and you drop the table. No, that's useful for that. That's okay. I mean, what is the expectation of recovering that, that table? It's like, well, we need to recover a table from 10 years ago. Well, I mean, you're gonna have to wait a couple of days. That's okay, I mean, it's 10 years old. But yeah, in general, I would remove PG dump, even if it's a small database, uh, I would remove it as a backup solution because of the point in time recovery. So another, uh, op another, op uh, sorry, <laughs> another uh, kind of the same case because it's related with recovery, not satisfying the RTO policy, but different. Here we're gonna use physical backups, huh? not logical backups. But let's talk about really big databases. Uh, how many? 72 terabytes, did Charlie say? That's a really big database. Huh? Uh, the physical backups doesn't have to be PG-based backup. You can take a snapshot. Hmm? Uh, file system snapshot. Uh, well, in, in the cloud, you can take snapshots of, at the cloud level. So let's say you have a large database high wall consumption, so it's like, it's generating tons of walls every day. And tons, I mean tons and thousands per hour, for example. And we're taking physical backups. And well, you know, 
there's always somebody who drops an important table. It's never that silly table that, that you know, nobody cares about. It's always the most important table, you know, the user's table. Uh, it's never the logs table, like the logs table. Yeah, it's important, but you know, if you lose the logs, it's like, well, eh, okay. So uh, what happens here? Like, we, uh, we need to recover. So uh, the problem is that restoring the backup it's going to take a long time. So if our RTO is very small, 20 minutes, hmm? 20 minutes is a lot. I mean, usually in businesses, losing 20 minutes is losing a lot of money. So what can we do? I mean, we got our physical backups. We got, we got the walls. We, we set everything up as expected to have backups in cases like this, you know, to be able to recover that table. Well. In cases like this, what you can do, add a delayed replica. So you put a replica delayed in time. So you, you don't have the problem that Charlie mentioned, that replication is always super fast. In this case, replication is fast, but Postgres doesn't apply the changes. So the walls are in the, in the replica. They're just not applied to the tables. So it's, it's just streaming, but not applying. So, how does recovering from a delay replica work? Mm -hmm. So, we configure the apply delay to a number of hours, n hours, and your design. Two hours, one hour, 12 hours, we had a customer that had 24 hours. That's okay. The recovery process is just gonna look and say, okay, I got this record that just came in the walls. How old is it? more than an hours, okay, then I apply it. If, if it's not, then I'll wait. So I do this with the recovery mean apply delay. That is gonna tell it how much it has to, it has to wait to apply the records that come in the wall. Then we need to have thorough monitoring because, I mean, if I have 12 hours or 24 hours of delay, and I wait like 30 hours to say, oh, you know, they, they dropped the table two days ago. It's like, well, it's a bit too late, you know. And well, we need to uh, capture or the commit ID or have like good logging with uh, the transaction IDs and or, or the transactions that, or the queries or the DDLs or whatever. I, I say DDLs because it's very likely a drop table, but it could be, you know, the typical delete without the where clause. And then we just, you know, configure recovery target uh, and apply it on the replica. Restart the replica, and then we got the replica with the data that was lost. Hmm? Something like this. Hmm? So let's say a disaster happens. Well, first thing we do immediately, we pause the replica that is delayed. We pause it. And then we start looking to see if the, the data has been lost. I mean, is it still there? If it's there, then okay. Start panicking, start working. Then we search for the commit ID or the transaction ID that applied that catastrophic query that was executed, uh, drop table, delete, whatever. And we set the appropriate target time or, tra or target XID we set the target action to pause, which is one of the other actions that you can do. It's so, <laughs> sorry, target pause is gonna do the same as PG wall reply pause. It's just, I mean, it gets to that point and it pause and you can connect over and check. And you remove the recovery mean apply delay because you want it to just go to that point and pause. You don't want it to delay or, or do something funky in the middle. You want it to get there as soon as possible so that you can recover the data. And you restart the replica. This is gonna reply all the walls. It gets to the transaction ID or the target time, depends on what you configured, and you got your data back, sort of. <laughs> then you can decide if you promote the replica and use it as the new primary or you just dump the data and restore it somewhere else. There are a couple of caveats with this that we found out uh, last year. <coughs> For example, it doesn't work. I mean, 
you won't be able to dump the data without promoting if, for example, it was a, dro a drop table. Because the drop table on the primary first acquires uh, an exclusive lock and then sends the DDL and the locks do not have uh, the transaction time stamp. So the lock is applied immediately on the replica and then comes later comes the drop table. So when you connect to the replica, the lock is already there. The drop table hasn't landed yet, but you can't access the table. So you need to promote it and then extract the data. That's like, had some conversations with Robert Haas about that. Uh, something to, I don't know, we'll, we'll talk about that and see if we can get maybe, I mean, the options are to add transaction, uh, transaction timestamps or, or track the timestamp of the transactions for locks in the walls or, well, promote the replicas. <laughs> but it was kind of funny because we were testing, a customer came with that and I said, that's impossible. I mean, this, I've used this in the past. I just didn't think about the case of, I mean, you, you would normally, like somebody deleted a bunch of data or did something and I was like, well, okay, get it from the delayed replica. Never thought about the locks, <laughs> locking the table, but it is, it is like that. Okay, so uh, what I said, once you get to the, the state where you, you have the replica, you got the two options, or you promote the replica, and you got a, like a primary node, uh, then you can like rebuild the other replicas and use that as the primary, or you can just ext extract the data, and uh, you can extract it paused if you can, or you can promote it and extract the data, and then rebuild the replica. Okay. Second case, backups in the same store, in the same, sorry, in the local storage. Huh? So the conditions of this, and, and I've seen this, and I, I can tell you I've seen this. We got the primary node that has their PG, the PG data in some storage. It can be an attached storage or it can be a network storage, doesn't matter. And then you got your backups, and the backups are in the same storage. So you're basically, you know, duplicating space in the same storage. Yeah, something like this. Huh? Let's, you know, imagine that Postgres is mounted on an NFS file system, or it could be attached to, to some storage. And we do, we run a comment like this once a week. And we got archiving, like, you know, here I have something like backup. Eh? <laughs> these would be the backups and we could have someone, something that is like backup wall where we, we dump the walls hmm? with an archive command, which is basically a copy because it's in the local file system. So, I mean, what can happen here? It's, I got my backups. Well, what can happen, you know, is that the volume becomes unavailable. And the case that we had here was a customer that was using, um, what's this Red Hat uh, cluster suite? Uh, a passive active node, and they had their database on those. So, I mean, the idea is kind of nice, or, or but uh, until it doesn't work like in this case. So they have, uh, they have fencing, so both nodes cannot mount the storage. The storage can only be mounted by one or the other. The problem that the customer had is that for some reason the cluster suite didn't work and it fenced both nodes and they ended up without the nodes and they didn't know how to bring it back up and somebody said, let's get the backups. And I said, well, <laughs> let me check where the backups are. Oh, the backups are in the same storage. So there's no backups. Uh, the good thing there is that, I mean, the database was, was in place, it just was not accessible. So they were like two or three, two days without the database. It was a shopping cart, so they were losing money. Uh, but eventually Red Hat came in, they, shot, they, they called support, and they fixed their fencing, and they got that. Once the fencing was fixed, 
the storage was mounted, everything was working. Then they moved to primary standby, which is the, the correct solution. Hmm? But yes, never store your backups. Never, never, ever store the backups in the same disk storage where you have your data. It's like, if the disk breaks, you lose your data and your backups altogether. This is the solution. Huh? You got your primary, you got a replica. But even if there isn't a replica, just having the backup on a separate, somewhere aside with different storage, that's how it should be set up. OK, so now we got, we got one node, we got backup somewhere else. It's all there in the same data center, all running together very nicely. Well, I mean, we're, we're fixed. It should, everything should be fine, right? Well, this is a real, you, you, you see the name right there, no? OVH, cloud, everybody remembers this, right? It's like two years ago. Uh, and I, I love this, this tweet from Octave. So Octave is the, the, the CEO of OVH. Read the last sentence. Uh, we recommend to active your disaster recovery plan. <laughs> you got your backups on the same data center. What recovery plan do I have? I'm doomed. So this is kind of the solution that you need, you know. You got, I mean, OVH has different data centers. You just need to put some data in one, put your backup in another, and you can just recover from your, from the other data center. I mean, if one catches fire or is flooded or, I mean, those are natural disasters. You, you're not gonna control that. So it's better to keep it somewhere else. You know, Amazon has different regions and that's the reason for different regions. You got stuff in East Coast, West Coast, you got Sao Pablo. Someday we'll have it in Argentina. <laughs> uh, and it will be closer, you know, it's just a fiber optic. It goes from Sao Pablo to Toninas in Buenos Aires and that's it. An even better solution is this. Yeah, so you got replica, you got the backup, two different data centers. Huh? So if, that, that, if the main data center goes down, you got the backups and you got the replica. So you can actually promote this replica, bring production back up, and you got backups just in case. You'll have to probably do some work on the backup you know, so it goes to the new primary, but you're good. I mean, business is good, and you just need to go and talk with OVH to see where you put your new data center, your DR data center. So now we got two data centers, primary, standby, standby somewhere else, backups, never where the primary is. Always in another data center. Even if you have three data centers, better. Or three different regions in, in, in a cloud provider. So this is what we have. Primary, replica, replica, backup. Very nice, yeah, lovely. So isn't this the right solution? Well, there are a couple of uh, things to take into account. So again, I go to the conditions. A large database has high wall consumption. So high, High transactions per second. You know, the, the, a customer that has, the, like, maybe consumes 100, 200 walls per second. I mean, that's, that's like a not so big customer. We have some, I have, we have one of the customers that does like over 1,000 walls per second. So that's big. So what do we have? We, got, we have some latency while you're taking the backups, especially if the backups are like, you know, 20 or 30 terabytes and you're doing something like an R-Sync or a PG-based backup, which is, it's not an R-Sync, but it's, it's reading and copying, you know, over the network. If you're doing something like snapshots, well, at some point you need to stream that snapshot somewhere else. I mean, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and, and Google, they do it transparently. You, you take the snapshot, say, oh, I got my backup. Yeah, but Google underneath is just, pushing it to their object store. 
or at least Amazon is doing that. I don't know Google and, and Microsoft. <laughs> um, so the copy of the backup is going to compete with the replication. Remember, we had we had replication going in this direction together with the backup. So they're, they're, we're copying the backup, we're copying the walls twice for each one of those arrows, it's copying the same wall. So we're overusing the bandwidth that we have there. So what's gonna happen? Well, the DR replica is gonna start to lag, the backups are gonna take longer because the backups are also competing with the, the replication. And the wall files are going to start to accumulate on the primary node. This actually happened with one of the customers. The guys up there surely know which one it is. Um, because they had their Barman server in one region and the primary server in another. And so the, the, the backups and everything had to cross over the fiber optic in the US to get from one side to the other. Solution. Nice. We take the backup from the local node. We got a replica. We can take backups from replicas. So we can just take the backup from the replica on the DR site instead of crossing over to the main data center. You can see that I put solution one. It's because I got solution two, which is even better. We take backup from the two replicas. So we got a backup on the my main data center and we got a backup on the DR. If the main data center goes down, we promote this node and we got backups. If the DR site goes down, we got backups. If the primary node goes down, well, let's say this got promoted, this, this guy gets promoted, well, he has backup and then we just reconfigure the, config, the connection from this replica to point here and everything is fine. This is an architecture that we had uh, in our local infrastructure at Second Quadrant. It was uh, on our internal nodes that we used. We would have something like this with a primary, two standbys and different data centers, each one with backups. So whenever we needed to reconstruct because there was a failover, the backups were working. Nothing had to be touched there unless the standby goes down, then, well, yeah. If a standby goes down and you need to reconstruct it, then you need to also take a new base back up there. But, I mean, it's a standby. Okay, how am I? Am I good? In time. 20 minutes, okay, I'm great, perfect. Uh, I might even do a demo. <laughs> okay. Remote network file system for wall archiving. This, this we've, I, I don't know if it's very common nowadays. Uh, it's been common, at least in my nine years of support and RDBA engineer, where customers would. Uh, actually, we set up Barman on, on one customer. I did it as a consulting engagement. And when we finished setting up the Barman with wall archiving, everything was working, they were super happy. I said, well, I mean, <coughs> Uh, no, we were setting up archiving. I said, you're archiving locally with uh, archive command, so you, you'll have to archive in, into Barman instead. I said, no, no, but we don't want to touch this because it's working. I was like, looking at it and I said, this is not working, but okay. Good thing is that Barman has streaming of walls. So we could just stream the walls and they can keep their archive copy in that network file system. And everything worked. It worked well for them to keep that archive of walls for their standbys while we had backups with walls for point in time recovery. They could have also just used Barman to recover the walls from there, which is what I'm going to show here. So, <clears throat> basically, this is what the customer had you know, just huge NFS, well, huge, I mean, big database uh, NFS 
uh, mount point uh, for the backups. Usually they'll have there the backups and the walls, you know, all together, base backups and a wall archive. So they will throw everything inside there. And then on the standby, they'll have the same thing. You know, they mount the same storage on both nodes. And on the, on the standby, they have a restore command instead of an archive command. And instead of copying from the PG wall, I mean, from the wall path to the archive, it's copying from the archive to the wall path. So the, the percentage P is replaced with the path to the wall directory that Postgres knows which is, which it is, you know, he knows it because it's configured, plus the wall file at the end, it's just the whole path together. While percentage F here is just the file. You saw that in the one before, it's the P goes first because I'm copying from the PG wall to the archive, and then in the recovery, it's the other way around. It, this worked. I mean, people were using this like everywhere. Uh, how much? Like seven, eight years ago, or more. This is kind of what it looks like. So you got the primary, your your replica. Uh, the walls go in this direction, and if the replica needs walls that are not on the primary, like the standby will jump from primary con info to restore command. Once it fails with restore, when it fails with restore command, it jumps back to primary con info. When it fails with primary con info, because the wall isn't on the primary, it goes back to back and forth. I think it's like a five second between one and the other when it fails. So when it fails, you know, it goes and checks on the storage, well, checks on the restore command and pulls the, the wall from, from wherever it is. So what are the problems? We, yeah, why would I be talking about this if, if there wasn't a problem? Well, the problems are <laughs> that it's not that easy to know how to perk that wall archive that we're building. So we're, we're sending walls into an archive directory, but how do we clean it up? We don't want, we don't want to archive that walls there forever. At some point we want to you know, start cleaning it up. But you know, when do we clean it up? How do we clean it up? How much do we remove from that directory? Hmm? And I, I think that the worst part here is that people start to uh, build their homebrewed cleanup scripts, which are very complex bash scripts with if, if commands in the middle, sorry, if conditions in the middle. And they think that it's, wow, look what I did. And then one day it doesn't work. <laughs> and they fill up the whole archive directory. And, oh, one thing I forgot there. And one thing about filling up the wall archive is that, well, you say, well, it doesn't matter. It's an NFS partition. It doesn't really matter. What happens when the wall archive, I mean, where I'm copying the walls with archive command gets filled? What happens? Hmm? No, no. The file well, it's not in the archive, that's for sure. But what happens later? Anyone? Yeah, if you look at the logs, yeah, you get an alert, yeah. What, what if you don't look at the logs? We're talking about customers, huh? That's... What happens? You can't answer, Pablo. What happens? What happens with archive command? Well, that's for sure. It better not be recycled. It's not archived. Well, we're not talking about recovery. What happens on the primary? Nobody knows what's going to happen in the primary after like 24 hours of archive command failing. Which disk? The PG data, the PG wall. Excellent. There we got. I'm going to do like Dimitri. 
Well, if I can find. You got a t-shirt. Get it, there you go. Got a lot more here. So, things that I've seen in these customer servers. Oh, this is one. I mean, th th this is fairly okay. I mean, I just have to find over the, the, the wall archive uh, and just checks anything that is older than three days and deletes it. It's okay. I mean, if you have walls older than three days and your standby needs them, well, maybe it's better to just do a new base backup. Hmm? Yeah. Depends. I mean, it depends on how much walls you consumed in three days. But usually, if, if you have a very active OLTP server, three days, re I mean, recovering three days of walls might be like a whole week. Hmm? And you might not want that. And maybe a base backup is, is a much easier and quicker way to recover. I'm talking about rebuilding standbys, not about recovery of backups. Hmm? This is the other one that we see very often. The, this is a tool that comes with Postgres. You can find it in the binaries, PG Archive Cleanup, which is, I mean, it's neat because what it basically does is you, you put it inside <coughs> um, the Archive Cleanup command of the replica, and what it's going to do is once it recovers a wall, it's going to execute this command, which basically removes any wall that is older than the wall that was recovered. This has two problems. Well, I don't, um, I'm not sure if it has the second problem. Uh, maybe somebody's going to correct me, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I'm not sure, that's why. Uh, but it has one problem, that is, what happens if I have multiple standbys? Which, like, how can the PG Archive cleanup know if the other standby needs this wall that I have already recovered? It might be that I have it, but the other replica doesn't have it, and he might need it. So this works okay if you have one replica. Another problem that it has, and it's not the one that I'm not going to tell you because I think it's, I'm going to be wrong, is that you're cleaning up walls. What if you have backups? I mean, I might not need it for the replica to recover, but I might need it to do point-in-time recovery at some other point with base backup that I have. So that's another reason why not to have this. So we go back to the initial slide. Eh? Things to consider, you know, the, the, what we talked about, you know, the how and the when of the wall, the wall cleanup. You know, we got the wall archive. How do we clean it? When do we clean it? How much do we clean at each, at each step? So the probable issues are that the, the cleanup might remove walls that are still needed when I have multiple standbys, as we just mentioned. Or the cleanup might not work. Let's say I have a script and the script for some reason fails. Uh, we forgot to put some good logging, so you know it's failing and nobody knows it's failing. And one day, you know, uh, hey, the NFS server is at 100%. What happened? Yeah. <clears throat> so what's the solution that I would use here? Well, I, was use, I would use Barman. So who doesn't know Barman here or hasn't heard of Barman or hasn't used Barman? Nobody uses, you use Barman. Uh, eh? Who doesn't know what Barman is? Okay, okay. So, Barman is a tool developed by Second Quadrant even before I joined Second Quadrant. So it's like 12 years old, maybe? Something like that. Uh, definitely more than 10 years old. No, it's uh, gonna be 10 years old now. Yeah, that's, that's it. So, Barman is written in, in Python. It's just a backup administration tool or management tool or uh, management of backups. 
So you can take backups, you can do archiving, you can do recovery, and you can set up policies. It's pretty much like PG backrest. Yeah? Actually, David Steele liked a lot Barman before he wrote backrest. Hmm? Uh, but but they, essentially, they both do kind of the same thing, uh, different. It, it's, it doesn't do it the same way, but they have like the, if from, if we look at it from far away, they look very similar. When we get very close, then okay, they're not the same. There are a few differences. So just like backrest, Barman has what, these two commands, uh, the wall archive and the wall restore. Yeah? One you put in your archive command and the other you put in your restore command. And what these two commands do, do is the wall archive is just going to be pushing the walls to the Barman server for backup consistency. And the wall restore on the standbys will be pulling them whenever they need a wall. So essentially what you have is a wall hub in your backup server. So why copy it somewhere else? You know, your backup server has to have all, all the walls because else you cannot do point in time recovery. So the solution is use Barman. Okay. This one is very interesting. Encrypted backups. <clears throat> it's very popular now. Everybody talks about encrypting. I mean, they, they, we, we're talking, everybody's talking about getting TDE for Postgres, you know, big discussions. Anybody who's, you know, reading hackers and stuff like that, you'll know that there is the last like three years, well, Bruce just left, he was involved in that uh, at least no, more, more than three years or four, that TDE is a thing transparent data encryption. It's a thing in Postgres, a thing that we want to have in Postgres, but it's very complicated. But what we can have is, and it's very easy, is have encrypted backups. It's very easy to encrypt backups. You just need a GPG key or some way to encrypt. And obviously you need a way to decrypt. So, Here's our situation, real situation. This was real situation. Uh, backups were shipped encrypted, which is great. That's good. Uh, obviously, that it was just performed. I think it was performed with GPG. So there was the public key was in the server, so it could encrypt before it ships it to the remote site. And then all of a sudden, there was a catastrophic event. We need the backup. Great. We got backups. That's excellent. The private key was nowhere to be found. No private key, no decryption. Well, what can I say? We need a double face palm because when the fail is so strong, one face palm is just not enough. Uh, it's just, uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, this one has a very, very easy solution. Very easy solution. I mean, not for the customer. The customers, yeah, I mean, if, if you don't have the private key, it's, <laughs> those backups are not recoverable. How would you, I mean, okay, I, I'm gonna ask before I show the, the, the next slide. What would be the solution the prior to, I mean, when you're architecting this, how would you resolve this? Like, what was missing? What's the missing key here? Speak up. Uh, yeah, of course, but you know, there's something else. Who said that? No, you can't. Come on, Pablo. You're, you're. I don't know what trials are. <laughs> I'll give you one. Oh. <laughs> 
So yeah, regularly test your, test your backups. Actually, you should always test your backups after the backup is done. The, the backup finishes, the first thing you need to do is test that the backup is recoverable. If you had tested this, you would know where the, the private key for decrypting is. So this brings me to one of my last slides, which is the slide that I always put in my backup calls talks. The condition for any backup is unknown until a restore is attempted. Hmm? Once you attempt the restore, it's failure or success. It's one of the two. The guys from, the, the, from this last case, it was failure. But they just didn't know it. That's why they had the Schrodinger's backup. <clears throat> OK, so conclusion for the talk, always have a recovery plan. And actually, I, I read this in, I heard it in one of uh, Josh Berka's calls. Don't only have a backup plan, have it written, printed, with a staple hanging outside the data center so that when you're going in, you grab it and you start reading it. You, you don't store it inside the server that you want to recover. No, never. It has to be printed somewhere. <laughs> Always test your recovery, a recovery of your backup. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that you can do is, while you're automating your backups, you can, you can automate, you can trigger the recover right after the backup finished. No? So the backup finished, okay. You spin up a node, push the backup there, recover, run some tests, all successful, we're done. Well, and there are always multiple ways of recovering from a disaster. We, we saw uh, a delayed standby, we got point in time recovery with, uh, uh, with, with backups, normal physical backups. Uh, well, I didn't put there that you shouldn't use PG base backup, a PG dump for for backing up, which would be another conclusion that it was at the beginning. And as always, do not rely on homebrewed homebrewed scripts. I mean, my first backup tool was a script that I wrote, of course. But I mean, I'm very old. That was a long time ago. It was uh, Postgres 8.2, 8.3 that I said, okay, let's write something down. You got an NFS. It was just a simple script. I would never use that. <laughs> it wasn't production, but I mean, it was production many years ago when we used to do that. Today, you know, you would use a tool like Backrest, Barman, WallG, something that is tested, something that you know is active and, and working. Okay, so I have, before we go to the questions, I have to say that we're hiring. Yeah, so, um, actually, I have a couple of rec requests that I need to uh, fill in for Python developers. So, uh, very excited. Open source uh, development. So, we're going to be working with the community. Uh, so, if somebody's interested, you can reach out to me. Uh, and now we can go to the questions. Autin? Wait, wait. When you repoint the replica in, in the um, scenario, I think it was case four, you have the, the remote, uh, the DR. When you need to, let, let, let's say your primary is down and you need to repoint your replica in the DR to the previous replica. There. I mean this one? Yeah, yeah. Is there a smart way to do it uh, in, in, which doesn't involve uh, taking a, a fresh backup from the new primary? the prior replica or or okay so if you were using a tool like well, i am um, hmm, i'm gonna say something very foolish i think patroni will automatically do that i mean if, if you pick the correct replica to promote mm -hmm. the other replica has to be behind else you're losing data so it's basically patroni would go in reconfigure the the configuration and restart the replica mm -hmm. so that it starts uh replicating from the new primary Okay. So it does like a promotion, then, uh, well, Rep Manager did the same thing, right? Yeah. 
Rep Manager does the same thing. Yeah, I, I need to get back to Rep Manager. Okay. Um, and the other one is, how would you test, uh, fully test your backup, right? So only restoring the backup is not enough. Well, yeah. You could, I mean, that's... Um, like com coming from the MySQL world, you would just uh, set it as a secondary and run, let's say, PT table checksum. That, yeah. that, that, that it will do um, a full check on the, uh, on the actual data. There's one way to do that. So one thing that you can check, you're, you're talking about consistency, which is different from what I was thinking, which is get your application running over it. Right. You know, like, like run, run your automated test over okay. the restore backup to see if they still pass. I mean, if they didn't pass with production, then they're not going to pass with the backup either. But you know, if, it, if, if you have automated tests that are passing fine with production data, it should pass with the backup that you just did. Uh, but the way to see if there's inconsistencies, mm -hmm. PG dump, PG restore. That would take care of, co of corrupted data, let's say, right? And inconsistent data, yeah. OK. Thank you. Usually, usually uh, when customers find out that they have data cor corrupted, it's or vacuum running, or they have a PG dump, or something like uh, something that actually reads the whole table or the whole database. You know, like if you have a table that is corrupted, and all of a sudden auto vacuum goes through it and it's a poof, error. You also can do a PG dump from the replica too, but you need to pause the replication. You pause the replication and do the PG dump. I had a client who needs to have PG dumps. But not from the master. Bad client. No, no, no. I'm just saying that works. <laughs> yeah, no, but he, he, he was talking about the, the restored node. Like, you're, you're testing your backup. You do a physical backup. And now you need to test it. You restore it. You bring it up. It's working. He says, is there anything else to do? Well, run a PG, PG dump over the, the, the node that you just recovered. Restore it. If both pass, then everything should be fine, should, triple quoted. Makes a diff, like a, a, a diff in the data. Uh, yeah. yeah, you that could. That would be your, your only way to be 100% sure that the data is still the same because you, you, you will get the new rows or events from the replication and you can then like consistently check at one point in time that you choose. Yeah, it's not it's not very simple. Like yeah, no, no, customers, no, no. customers usually, for example, for migrations, they they request to to know if everything was exactly migrated. It's uh, like, well, how? I mean, I, I can do a count. I can. I, I remember long. This actually had something that did like a, a, a an MD five hash over each table and it would compare one with the other. But it was just like, come on, it's just terribly slow. That when you recover the the the, the backup. The database is ready to accept connection is not enough. <sighs> well, that for, tells you. For me, it's enough. It, it, I it, 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 okay. It's enough. It is a good start. Um, well, I, I restored the P, the, the P, 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 T, P, I, P I T R mm -hmm. and the 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 wall were restored and. Database is ready to Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a very good start. I would say that in some cases that is enough. Uh, but, you know, it really depends on the policy of the business. Like if the business needs like proof that this is really, I mean, is this really going to work? Uh, and they can afford, you know, spending more time, more resources. The cloud is not free, you know. You, you think it's another layer of PG dump? It's... It's going to test consistency of the of the backup that you just recovered because it's a physical backup. Think of it this way: a physical backup is just a copy of the files. It's, it's like my first backup script that I told him. It was just basically pg start backup tar pg data to this remote uh, place and the name of the tar with the timestamp, whatever. Hmm? Pg stop backup. That was it. Yeah. I'm copying files. Well, I'm doing a tar, but it's also going over the network. And, you know, who knows what happens with the data? 
we get sometimes corruption. I think there were some bugs like uh, seven years ago that were related with the streaming of the wall of the of the walls, yeah, of the changes. So you know, who knows? I mean, of course, we have a CRC on the walls. We 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 could also have CRC on well. You can have a CRC check on the on the PG data if you want it. You just have to set it up at initdb. So what what the automates test? Hmm? So what are the automates test? Well, a, a PG dump and a PG restore. At least it reads all the data, and then it tries to restore it. The read is the one that checks that the the, the data files. The Postgres can actually read all the data in your data file. The restore says, OK, this that I read is consistent. Basically, it's, there's nothing funky. You know, the, the, the foreign keys and the primary keys match. There's nothing wrong. You don't have duplicate rows. I mean, duplicate in terms of unique indexes. If, yes. But you know what? You know what? If the indexes are corrupted, yeah, you can create it. It's that. the least of the problems. I mean, yeah. uh, for for checking consistency uh, corruption on indexes, we have another tool, which is AmCheck. So you can also run AmCheck. There, you got another tool to run. AmCheck. We got time for another question. Is there another question? I'll give a sock to whoever asks another question, or a T-shirt. Now you got yours. No? Oh, up there. Somebody wants a, I'll give it to you. I'll remember you. Got it here. I'll separate it. Hello. Do you I think re-index and vacuum full, it's sufficient to check, uh, to validate the restore? Okay, vacuum full would be uh, kind of equivalent to doing a PG dump because it, it, what it does is, I mean, obviously it rewrites also, but it's just reading the data and writing it. Um, what I think it's not going to do is check consistency, which is the part that PG restore does. Um, I don't know. Now I'm thinking about it. Maybe it does. Never thought about that one, but also PG uh, vacuum full is very, it's a bit dangerous vacuum full over the whole database because you need space to hold. Like if you have like a very big table, you're going to be copying it twice plus the indexes. So usually I uh, kind of like don't use PG dump, I mean PG, sorry, don't use vacuum full unless you have some downtime and you need to check that you have enough space to actually copy that table with all its indexes because that's more or less what uh, so dump. pg jump is, is faster i didn't and say it's fast well it is faster i don't know if it's faster dump and restore than a vacuum full but at least you don't need the whole i mean you do a pg dump you could store it in some temporary place, then you, you remove all the data and you try a restore. Well, if you do vacuum full and the database, it, it doesn't do it in parallel, it does one at a time. But still, if you have a really big date, a bit, really big table, say you have a table of one terabyte plus indexes then you need all that space or you'll flip over. OK. No more questions? OK, thank you very much. I